distinct opportunity for Columbus Rotary to welcome Steve Barkley today. As you know, uh, actually as five minutes ago, the Dow was down another 150 and it's being blamed on China. And uh, Steve uh, first served the Hong Kong government as a police inspector in 1979. He served there with a wide variety of posts with policy responsibilities, including consumer protection, intellectual property, housing, and environmental protection. For, the, for four years until July 2014, Steve was the director of Hong Kong Economic and Tra Trade Office in Sydney. So with that, Columbus welcome, will welcome Steve Barkley. Thank you very much. This is my uh, first visit to Columbus, uh, my first visit to Ohio. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words to you. Um, I've been asked to talk about Hong Kong before and after 1997, 97 being the time when sovereignty reverted from the UK back to the People's Republic of China. Coincidentally, I've been working for the Hong Kong government about 18 years before 1997, and about 18 years after 1997. So I have a fairly good perspective on what has and hasn't happened during, during that period. Some of you will know that Hong Kong was a British colony, and that part of Hong Kong was ceded to Britain in perpetuity by China during the Opium Wars. And part of China, uh, Hong Kong was leased to Britain, at least to, Hong, at least to Britain. And that lease was a 99-year lease which expired on the 30th of June, 1997. And in the late 70s, the early 80s, people in Hong Kong were starting to fret about what would happen when the lease expired. Some of you will recognize the lady on the right as being Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister of Britain, and the gentleman sitting down on the left is Deng Xiaoping, the then paramount leader of China. They agreed that formal negotiations would uh, take place on the future of Hong Kong. These took place between 1982 and 1984 and resulted in a document called the Joint Declaration. This provided that sovereignty would return from UK to the People's Republic of China. All of Hong Kong, not just the, the least area, all of Hong Kong's sovereignty would return to China. But that the people, the way of life for people in Hong Kong would continue for 50 years after 1997, up until 2047, under the one country, two systems concept. Under the one country, two systems concept, sovereignty would return to China, Beijing would be responsible for foreign affairs, defense, and constitutional matters. But apart from that, the Hong Kong government, after 1997, would have a high degree of autonomy to run Hong Kong, uh, as it had before. And for example, um, continue with the Hong Kong government, continue with the Hong Kong civil service, police, customs, immigration, judiciary, and so on. English would continue as an official language. We would continue to adopt the common law as our legal system instead of the continental legal system that uh, exists in China. We'd have our own judiciary, continue with our own judiciary, in which British and Commonwealth judges and magistrates would continue to sit on the bench, including on the Court of Final Appeal, Every case heard in Hong Kong by the Court of Final Appeal will have at least one foreign judge sitting on, sitting on the bench. So, in 1997, 30th of June, midnight, the British flag came down, the Chinese flag went up. Many of you will remember uh, the scenes in uh, in a, a large hall in Hong Kong. Traumatic moment for many people. Um, and what was gonna happen the next day? 
Many people had predicted that the tanks would appear on every street corner. Queens Road Central would be renamed Mao Zedong Avenue. The lifts would stop working. The intellectuals would be sent off for re-education. The expatriates, such as myself, would be put on the first available plane. It didn't happen. And China continues to honor its commitments under the, the agreement with Britain, which were translated into the basic law. The basic law is Hong Kong's mini constitution, and this document put the, the flesh on the bones of the agreement between Britain and China. And for example, all of the, the freedoms that existed in Hong Kong before 1997 continue to be uh, maintained in Hong Kong. Freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of religion, freedom of information. For example, every time Google shuts down, gets shut down in China, it continues to operate unimpeded in Hong Kong. Many companies are now, for many years, have been setting up their data centers in Hong Kong. They want to be close to the action in mainland China, but they want to be located where they're guaranteed unimpeded access and no interference by government. Hong Kong's economy. When I arrived in 1997, Hong Kong was a manufacturing center. If we'd been sitting here in 1997, in 1979, and you looked in the collar of your shirt, gentlemen, the chances are it would have said made in Hong Kong. It was a textiles and manufacturing center. It, it manufactured for the world. Toys, watches, light electronic goods, plastic goods, and so on. Today, if you visit Hong Kong, you would be hard pressed to find a factory. Well, you find plenty of factories, but there's no manufacturing going on inside them. Hong Kong is now a services center. We derive 93% of our GDP from services. And you can't go much higher than that because some of the other categories are construction, telecommunications, and so on. So what are the, the, the services that drive Hong Kong's economy? Financial services, we're the number three financial services center in the world, after New York and London. Tourism, last year we had over 60 million business and tourist visitors. Two thirds of those were from mainland China. Logistics, based on Hong Kong's container port, which used to be number one in in the world in terms of container throughput. It's no longer number one in the world. It's no longer even number one on the China coast. But it's still very large. It's about number four or number five in the world now. Uh, and still very significant. And Hong Kong's airport. Hong Kong's international airport uh, started off with one runway when it was built uh, in the late, when it was completed in the late 90s. Then we, we started work on a second runway before we'd even finished the first and now we've given approval for a third runway and starting to think about a fourth. Uh, the water's getting rather deep next to the airport, so it may not be possible <laughs> to, to reclaim land, or certainly not to do it economically. So we're going to be struggling with that conundrum in the years to come. But the container port, the airport, which is the number one international airport in the world for air cargo, that's internet shopping for you, are the basis for our logistics industry. Uh, the success of our logistics uh, personnel, for example, the largest supplier of goods to Walmart is a company called Li and Fung, which is Hong Kong based. They don't own a single factory, but they know how to move stuff around and label it, package it, uh, and so on and so forth. Professional services, legal, 
accounting, design, and so on and so forth, all servicing the huge amounts of goods that are going in and out and through Hong Kong. Um, uh, and uh, Hong Kong is an extremely open economy, po possibly the most open economy in the world. Uh, we certainly welcome American businessmen, even from Columbus, Ohio, to come uh, and set up in Hong Kong. Um, just to make it worth your while, corporate tax is 16.5% and only on uh, revenue derived in Hong Kong. Personal tax is a maximum of 15%. No sales tax, no GST, no VAT, no tax on dividends, no capital gains tax. And we have surpluses on our budget seven or eight years out of 10. We have no debt. We sit on fiscal reserves that, are, that would be the equivalent of more than two years of government recurrent expenditure. We let you make your money, we let you keep it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the only person saying this. For example, the Heritage Foundation has for the past 21 years ranked Hong Kong as number one in terms of the world, uh, freest economy. It's the number one freest economy in the world for 21 years. And I've been forgetting to press my buttons. I think America's about four or five on that list. Foreign direct investment. This year, for the first time, we have made number two in the rankings after the US. So for a place with a population of seven million, just over, to be the number two on the international list of foreign direct investment is a, is a phenomenal achievement. Of course, all that money doesn't stay in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a conduit for money. All legal, of course. <laughs> what is Hong Kong's main role? These days, it's really one way or another, it's as a connector between the People's Republic of China and the rest of the world. Mainland companies come to Hong Kong to meet international companies. International companies come to Hong Kong to beat Chinese companies. Why do they come there? First of all, location, our tax system, our freedom of information, our business-friendly government, minimum regulation and red tape, a non-corrupt, high-quality judicial system and judiciary, low taxes, And not only are we close to China, we are within five hours flight of half of the world's population. So if you're looking to exploit business in our part of the world, and you want to be somewhere with a high quality legal system, low tax, hands off government, and you need to travel, Hong Kong is the perfect place to be. Now, some of you will have watched CNN or BBC World or even read the New York Times. Last year you will have seen in the, the last quarter um, the Occupy movement in Hong Kong or the Umbrella movement. You might even be forgiven for thinking that Hong Kong was on the brink of collapse. Uh, it isn't. But what was the, the Occupy movement about? The mainstream media here portrayed it basically as democracy good, China bad. But it was rather more nuanced than that. The basic law, which is Hong Kong's mini constitution, was introduced in 1990. That document said a number of things, including that 
At a suitable time in future, Hong Kong people may elect their chief executive by universal suffrage. It also said candidates for that election will be selected by a nomination committee. That was 1990. It, the basic law came into effect on the 1st of July 1997, when sovereignty returned to China. In 2007, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress said that in 2017, Hong Kong may elect its chief executive for the first time by universal suffrage. It also said candidates for that election will be selected by a nomination committee. Beginning of last year, the Hong Kong government initiated a consultation exercise on the details of the arrangements for the election in 2017. During the consultation exercise, basically the two sides of politics in Hong Kong focused almost entirely on the question of the nomination committee. The democratic camp said there must be no restriction whatsoever on candidates standing for election. The other side of politics said we should follow the basic law, what our constitution says. <clears throat> At the end of our consultation exercise, the government wrote a report to the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress to, to relay the, 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 the views expressed by the public during the consultation exercise. The Standing Committee studied this report and then in August last year announced that, yes, the election for the Chief Executive will take place in 2017 by universal suffrage, and yes, candidates will be selected by the nomination committee, at which point it hit the fan. <laughs> Outrage from the democratic camp that Beijing was interfering unreasonably in Hong Kong's democratic, uh, democratic development. Despite the fact that the basic law and the joint declaration provided that Beijing was responsible for foreign affairs, defense, and constitutional matters, despite the fact that the basic law in 1990 made clear that the candidates for chief executive would be selected by the nomination committee and reiterated in, 20, in 2007. Absolutely nothing new, absolutely nothing that was not constitutional. People came out on the street in Hong Kong, and unusually, because people are always out on the street in Hong Kong, we are the protest capital of the world. <laughs> what was different this time was they stayed out on the street. And when the Hong Kong police on one occasion used tear gas, the population was further outraged and even more came out on the street and they stayed for almost 80 days. Then it started getting cold. <laughs> and they eventually decided to go home. Had they gone home after a month, they would have had the, the government in a total bind because public support for them in the first few weeks was enormous. But they overstayed their welcome. They were disorganized, had no leadership, and, and so on and so forth. And frankly, they screwed up. But nonetheless, to get the proposals through is a constitutional change in Hong Kong, required several things to happen. It required government to put a proposal to the legislature. It required the legislature to pass the proposal by a two-thirds majority, it required the chief executive to endorse this, and then for the standing committee of the National People's Congress to also endorse it. In June this year, we put the proposal to the, leg the Legislative Council in Hong Kong. It did not get the two-thirds majority because the Democrats who had the blocking minority would accept nothing other than pure democracy, whatever that is. So we will still go ahead with the election for the chief executive in 2017, but instead 
of the 5 million people in Hong Kong who are registered voters having the opportunity to select from amongst the candidates. The nomination committee of 1,200 people will select the candidates and the 1,200 people of the nomination committee will elect one of those. The proposal that we put to the Legislative Council was not perfect, but it was a darn sight better than what we've still got. There I will end. I will take a few questions. Before any of you ask, the stock market in China will go back up. <laughs> I just don't know when. <laughs> yes, sir. I lived in the, I'm very happy and very surprised to hear some of your comments. I lived in the Orient, <clears throat> all in Japan, all through that area in the 60s, traveled in the 70s, had contact up through the 90s. Several of the magistrates and a few of the people I knew in government and business in the mid-90s left Hong Kong because they were British citizens and went to Canada or Great Britain. Can you tell me how many of the citizenry basically left Hong Kong back in the 90s? Difficult question because Hong Kong is a very free place. We don't, we don't monitor uh, this kind of information. Uh, if you are a Hong Kong permanent resident, you have a Hong Kong identity card, which you can use to enter and leave Hong Kong with smart gates. We don't know if on your travels overseas whether you have obtained citizenship of another country. We only know that you've come in and you've gone. I'll give you an example. If you ask the Hong Kong government how many... Australian citizens there are in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government will tell you that it's about eight or 9,000. And that's people that come in and out of Hong Kong using a Australian passport. If you ask the Australian Consul General in Hong Kong, he will tell you it's about 60, 70, 80,000. And he knows because Australian has compulsory, Australia has compulsory voting. So Hong Kongers, who are Australian citizens, who travel in and out of Hong Kong using their identity card, have to go to the consul, consulate, Australian consulate, to vote. Passport renewal, registration of their birth of children. So there's something like... 60, 70,000 Australians in Hong Kong who are also Hong Kong citizens. Um, what the number is for Americans, Canadians, Brits, I don't know. We don't know how many left, how many came back. Quite often, if you had a married couple or a family, one of them would leave to go abroad to, to, to uh, serve the, the three years, four years, five years residency, whatever was required to get permanent residence or citizenship, and then came back. We don't know exactly, but a lot, and a lot more, if you want me to be frank, would have left if they'd had the chance. But not everybody who wanted to go could go. I had also very nice memories of Hong Kong because I went to a semester abroad in a Chinese university in Sha Tin. And um, so, it's wonderful to hear the British accent and uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, talking about this. And um, I have family that lives in Hong Kong, who are Hong Kongese. And um, I know that for them, they have talked about recently two issues that I'd love to hear your perspective on. One is, you know, Hong Kong used to be, like you said, part of China and never had any politics. And since 97, there's a lot more politics in terms of the different parties and who's elected and so forth. So, um, and I know China, with this, especially with the recent uh, uh, riots, <coughs> uh, they've really done a nice job overall. So I'd love to hear your perspective on Chinese, uh, Hong Kong citizens with its politics. And then the second thing is, um, you know, there's so many Chinese visitors that's coming over over the weekend or whenever, and there's um, so much adoption of Mandarin now in, in, in Hong Kong. So I wanted to ask about what's the 
um, Chinese, uh, what's the Hong Kong population ability to absorb the Chinese visitors or immigration? <laughs> I'll answer your questions in reverse order. Uh, there is still a border between Hong Kong and the rest of the People's Republic of China. If you fly out of Hong Kong to a city in mainland China, it's an international flight. You need to be at the airport two hours in advance. If you cross the border, the land border by road or uh, rail, there's a, there's a, in most cases, there's uh, I need to go through uh, Hong Kong immigration and Chinese immigration, as you would with, with any other international travel. Of the 60 million visitors we had last year, two-thirds, about 40 million, were from the mainland. Um, I know that you already know the answer to your question, that um, 60 million people in a land area or visiting a land area of about 1,100 square kilometers, or about five or 600 square kilometers, uh, square miles, um, is a lot of people. It's over a million visitors a week. Uh, and uh, there are parts of Hong Kong where it gets really busy. Um, and there are no shortage of people in Hong Kong who are not very happy with the number of mainland visitors. Um, there are people in Hong Kong who, frankly, would like independence if they were given the choice. But that is not on the agenda. That was not what was agreed and ne negotiated and agreed between Britain and China. The language thing is also a sensitive thing. You know, you know, many, many communities around the world, they treasure their local dialect. The dialect in Hong Kong is Cantonese, and uh, Hong Kongers love it. They, they want to keep it. Um, but to be frank, most Hong Kongers also speak Mandarin now, uh, or Putonghua, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's a lot of talk in Hong Kong about reducing the number of mainland tourists which I find a little curious. I think it would be the first instance in the world of any tourist destination seeking to reduce the numbers of their highest spending visitors. <laughs> and they are the highest spending visitors by a, a clear margin. Normally you try and stop the backpackers and you know, <laughs> not those who go, go back home with an armful of gold Rolexes. And of course, there's very divided views in Hong Kong. Taxi drivers, hoteliers, restaurateurs, and so on and so forth are delighted to have 40 million high-spending visitors a year from China. Um, the, the local working class guy who can no longer get in uh, his favorite restaurant or its, it's you know, prices have gone up, he's not so happy. So there are mixed views in Hong Kong. I've gone over. Apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs>